Oh, good afternoon. How's everybody doing so far? Pretty good? All right. Plenty of room up front. If any of the uh, A students want to slide up front real quick. Uh, so you guys are on the educational track for backgrounds, and um, I've got a heck of a voice, so if I'm projecting too much or not enough, you know, let me know high or low. Um, what Deborah and I are going to talk about today, the topic du jour, is your background check came back with a hit. Now what? And a big part of that's going to be uh, adverse action, which she's going to talk about. So what Disa thought might be interesting, sort of in conjunction with that or congruent to that, would be kind of pulling the curtain back a little bit, like Wizard of Oz style and telling you guys, well, where do these hits come from? In other words, uh, you know, wh where are you sourcing this information from? How does a bill become a law in the world of background checks? How do I get a report and you are sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this is a hit for this person? I mean, does it come from Google? Is there a database? You know, what's going on with that? So that's what the two of us are gonna talk about today. Um, Deborah is your director over backgrounds for DISA. I don't work for DISA. I'm not an employee of DISA. Uh, my company, which is going to be rebranding soon as uh, SJV Data Solutions, we're a furnisher or supplier of that data to DISA and numerous other CRAs, large and small, all, all over the world. So whereas we don't specialize in the um, FCRA-based portion of background checks or assembling different things together, we're the ones that really supply them with the data directly from the primary source. And that's what you're gonna hear me talk mostly about today. Cool? All right. So your background check came back with a hit. Crap, now what? Thought that was a good applicant. I gotta get this person placed. What am I gonna do? This is costing me money by the day, so what's going on here? How did this hit, you know, come to be? So I always like to say, where did it come from? You knew you were searching this person, Maybe you knew where in general geography or Google Maps you were searching them, but where does it come from? And I thought I'd add a little bit of humor there, you know, this is going on your permanent record. When was the last time anybody heard that? Like middle school or high school? Like those things don't really exist anymore. But for me as a data supplier, dealing specifically with criminal records, that is permanent record. That's a permanent record at a court of law. And your name is tied to an issue or I guess a choice that, that you may have made that you're now on this record. That's your permanent record. Um, and as we have people trickling in after 210, another term I always have to throw around is tardy. You guys remember tardy? <laughs> oh man, you're tardy. You got so many tardies this month. And as you know, you get older, that's, um, no, you're not tardy, you're fired. So that's, you know, things change. So if you're coming in, you know, you're not too tardy just yet. So no need for criminal justice 101 you know, Miranda rights and booking becomes a case and an arraignment. I don't want to do all that. I just want to talk about some of the nuances that are involved in what we call public records research. That's really where a lot of the criminal hits that DIS is providing you are derived from. It's public records research. You can go into any courthouse in America and put a name in at a terminal or talk to a clerk. And we'll talk about some of those nuances. You can do that and they're obligated by law to give you the information and say, yep, this person did this thing this day and this time and they were brought to trial and their peers said this happened. Here you go, do with it what you may. And somewhere along the line, I guess 30, 40 years ago, somebody realized you could monetize this by protecting the workforce through supplying that data. And hence, background screening was born. So primary source verification. Uh, you're gonna hear a lot of sound bites from me today. Not just because I run a team of sales and marketing people, but that's my job. But you're going to hear things that I think will speak to you and your needs, things you can speak to DISA about and say, hey, look, is that primary source verified? So what I mean by that is there exists all these databases out there of criminal records activity. You know, uh, they bought data from some source or they, uh, Thompson Reuters or Experian, they have these, all this data, right, big data. None of that stuff is actually at uh, primary source verified, meaning when you order your background check through DISA, yeah, they're going to run a database search to make sure there's nothing out there in the world that that applicant didn't disclose to you on their application. Oh, yeah, I, I only lived in Atlanta the last seven years. Yeah, but I was in Texas and I killed somebody five years ago. Well, they're not going to tell you that. So you've got to run these nationwide searches to figure out if there are any skips to trace or any, any holes to fill in. 
when we get the order from DISA, they've already done that work. They figured out where this person has lived, where they've resided. Maybe they've done a motor vehicle report. They know where their address was, and they know where they've gotten mail the last seven years. <coughs> Excuse me. Because for the record, yes, it is freezing in here. So we're sniffling as speakers, too. So um, we then go to the primary source, the actual court where that record resides. And you do that two ways, two ways. Some more sound bites come in your way. You can go in person for straight up, old school, in, uh, in court research. You go to a terminal, you, know, you type stuff in, and those courts, it's like Windows 85, those terminals. <laughs> this stuff is not high tech, okay? And you're handing something off to a clerk of court saying, please, please do this for me in a week when you feel like it, because clerks take forever, we know that. Or a lot of the stuff is available online. Not many people know that, that the stat or the soundbite is about 40% of county level courts are available, from a, a county level, are available online. You can search those online. We have technology that goes out automatically and you know, gets the information, extracts it, provides it back to DESA so their process can begin. So 60-40 is the magical number here. 60% of the counties you have to go in person to search. 40% of the counties you can do online. And here's where it flips. Here's where you get a yin-yang effect. If you look at jurisdictions and you look at population dispersion, about 60% of people reside in the 40% of areas that are online. You guys following my web here? And about 40% of people reside in the 60% you have to go in person. Well, think about that. Anywhere there's greater population, greater commerce, greater technology, those courts are going to be more with the times. They're going to provide access to that information because you're demanding more of it. And you don't want to take up the clerk's time while they're helping the judge get ready for the cases that day and all that good stuff. So more populated areas, Los Angeles, parts of Chicago, parts of Atlanta, you know, New Jersey, you can do that stuff in an online. Now, you still have to have a formal account with the state. That's why our business is in the position that we're in. But you can get a lot of that stuff online. So just some backstory on the nuances of how you get those records. We have another thing called hit rate. You guys familiar with hit rate? Hit rate, yeah, that's, that's okay. We talk about hit rate all the time. An interesting statistic to think about within your business, if you're in charge of backgrounds, is your hit rate. What does that mean? That is simply the total amount of population you've done background checks on and what percentage hits have occurred for. That's your hit rate. So I sent you a uh, hundred of these and 10 of them come back with records. Is that, okay, 10%, whatever it is, right? That's your hit rate. So if you look at the type of businesses that you do and if more than maybe 15, 20, 30% of the applicants you're screening are coming back with hits verified from the primary source, you're screening a rough crowd, folks. Because in our line of work, all the CRAs we service, provide service to, our average hit rate that all these people send us internally is like 18%. And we're pulling back all the data with no restrictions, no federal level restrictions, no state restrictions saying you can't report this. As a furnisher, those do not, those do not apply to us. They do to DISA. So if ours is 18% internally, what we end up reporting to our customers is even lower. It's like 14%. So for us, the average hit rate of the American working population that is screened, and I think we're set to do about 16 million background checks this year at SJV, it's really only about 15% that are having hits. So if you go back home and you're looking, you say, hey, how many people have we searched this year who had records? And it's like 25, 30%. Talk to your recruiters. See what is going on there, because that may not be the best type of people um, that you want to be uh, hiring or placing. Just a heads up. Um, so there's a little bit of insight into you know, the population's choices, behaviors. That's all criminal records are, really, when you think about it. It's a choice somebody made. It's an action that they took for whatever motivation they had. And maybe their intentions were good or bad or whatever, but they got caught. And now it's on their permanent record. So. I talked a little bit about in-person and online. You know, what's the difference? Obviously, anything you do online is going to be faster. It's probably going to be streamlined. It's going to probably have provide a lot more data. When you go in-person to courts, 
Some of you may know that, believe it or not, most clerks aren't exactly having your business as a high priority, or Deese's or mine. So when we hand them searches and we say, look, you don't have a, a public access terminal here, get with the times. You, the only thing I can do is hand you this name, date of birth, social, and you're gonna do the background check for me and hand it back to me? It can take five to seven days or more. You guys have probably called into DISA and said, what is the holdup on this background check? Mother of God, you know, we're waiting for so long. Well, it's clerk assisted. It's clerk assisted, oh my gosh. In other words, we're waiting for an employee at the court to have literally nothing else to do than run that name in their system. They don't get paid by the name like we do. So it's just not a priority. One way we try to combat that and something DISA relies on us for is since a lot of our researchers are there in the courts every day, the network we manage, we have good relationships with them. We bring them donuts. We don't bribe them, but we ask how are they doing, how their kids are. Is that a new Chrysler Sebring you're driving? That's, that's amazing. Yeah, of course, they want to hear from you. They want to have a relationship with you. So that helps us expedite things a little bit. But when we come into a stack like in like New Hampshire or Massachusetts, which is the worst clerk-assisted state in the world, that ever knows the pain, and we hand over like 35 names on a Monday, man, we're lucky if we see like three of those by the end of the week. They just got a lot of stuff going on up there. So we try to mitigate that as best we can with you know asking the clerk, when will you please do your job for me? And when they tell us, oh, it'll be next Thursday, we tell Disa, it's gonna be next Thursday. Or we might pad it a little bit just to be sure. But you know, Thursday or Friday, it's coming back. That's where those ETAs come from. Those estimated time of arrivals from DISA, they come from our researchers in the field working directly with these clerks going, when are you gonna get on this for me? Because I'm giving you new ones every day. So what's the deal? So again, you don't really have to worry about that when things are online, it's a lot better. Um, do clerks make mistakes? Do you guys think clerks make mistakes that can cause errors in background checks? Yeah, probably, yeah, all the time. Um, when I was coming up through the ranks at SJV, I did court research in Atlanta. And I would go in and I would you know, type at Cobb County, just like learning the business. And I had a recheck come back or a dispute, which we'll get into in a minute. And I was like, oh, did I, did I do that one wrong? Did I mess that up? Oh, no, I, I had to ask the clerk about that. So I went back and I was like, hey, you cleared this name last week. This is clear, right? And they're like, oh no, there's a hit for that. You told me last week it was clear. What, what's going on? You just gotta live with it. So clerks are prone to making mistakes. They can fat finger. They could be looking in the wrong system. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. So just because we're waiting on the clerks doesn't make them infallible. So anytime you hear, oh, it's clerk assisted, that doesn't mean the clerk's gonna produce the most accurate check for you. They have to be uh, checked and balanced as well. Some folks also have, and this isn't uh, happening a lot in 2019, but uh, I've been at this game a while, so I remember back in the day, if I get court copies with every search, a copy of the record, I'm always gonna be good, right? Or if I need a copy of that record, I mean, they have a copy of that in a file room somewhere, right? I'm gonna be good to go if you tell me there's a hit on John Smith, very common name, and I get a copy of that background check, I'm good, right? Uh, yes and no. First of all, it's gonna take the clerk how long to provide that, because they've gotta get those copies. You can't just waltz into a archived records room full of everyone's names, dates of birth, and socials. Yeah, I'll just be over here, thanks. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna pick through some stuff. They won't let anybody back there to get those court copies. So you have to wait even longer. Um, it also takes a lot of time with the researchers who are conducting those searches, they don't get paid by the hour. So they've gotta charge a little bit more for the extra work involved in, here's a stack of records we're gonna give you, sift through these, make copies of what you need. It's a dollar per page, by the way. When you're done, bring it back, and then we'll, you know, you can settle up for the day. And they didn't, don't do any other searches during that time period. So getting court copies is more laborious, more labor equals more costs, and at the end of the day, there may not be anything in that copy that constitutes this is exactly who you're looking for. A lot of times identifiers get redacted. They get blocked out. Why? To prevent identity theft. Do you guys do any um, federal background checks? Federal criminal searches? Don't you love how there's no IDs on any of them? Isn't it great? Yeah, so <laughs> they've redacted those IDs and in order to have license to search their 
their, uh, their system or to go in person, if you see an ID, like a date of birth or a social, you're obligated by law when you search that as a third party to notify them of that so they can redact that. And that's like finding a diamond in a rough. A date of birth on a federal record isn't possible. So those are, again, just some of the nuances where court data is always readily available, but there's a lot of mistakes and a lot of holes and a lot of missing uh, gaps or issues that come along with that. So any questions so far? Because I'm just rattling like all this information about background checks out here. Okay. All about the hits. What kind of hits are there? When you run a background check through DC, oh, go ahead. So the system only allows you to search by name. You can designate where you're searching, nationwide federal records, an individual state, one of 94 individual federal district courthouses. You can designate you know, which layer you're looking at the, the cake in, but it will not provide you any type of confirmation that a date of birth you're providing matches or does not. It makes it pretty tough. But what DESA's team does, which is honestly, I'm not being paid to say this, it's kind of second to none. Deborah's got a team of people that actually go through the case archives, the case notes, and there's booking information sometimes. I guess I'm giving away trade secrets here, sorry. Um, there's booking information associated with like when the person was booked or arraigned. Sometimes there will be information from their driver's license on there. So it's not gonna pull up on the first page. Like, yeah, here's this person. But when you access the record and really get into the docket, and it's like they were arrested on February 12th, 1998, their driver's license number was 2645, date of birth, oh, it's way down under there. Okay, great. So they do find those from time to time. Hope that helps. Okay, any other questions so far? All right, you've had a chance to obviously see this on screen. I know you all can read, so I'm not gonna read them all verbatim, but these are the types of cases or uh, statutes, as some courts call them, federal, misdemeanor, you know, petty. I've got them classified into two different columns. Most of the violent, serious offenses most people are concerned about in the world of background screening, they're on this side over here. I guess that's your left, my right. Felonies, misdemeanors, drug-related offenses, um, theft of personal property or a store, you know, they were looting during a riot, woo, but they were too late and they got caught. Um, Traffic-related, I have like an innate fear of doing that, just so you know. Um, variants, they vary greatly by state. So what's a felony in one state may not be a felony in another. Class A, Class B, Grade 1, Grade 2, Level 1, it varies based on each municipality's or jurisdiction's individual court system and code. Now that's our job to be experts in that and then provide that data and that knowledge onto DESA so they can properly report that to you. For instance, what's, every single case in New Jersey, if you're truly arrested and booked and arraigned, it's a felony. It is 100% a felony every single time. Do you guys know that? What happens is when it's brought to arraignment, depending on the severity of the charge, it may be then downgraded to a misdemeanor. But when you look up that record, it's Vince Broad urinating in public after the Jets game or whatever it is, that's a felony offense. Oh my God, I've got a felony on my permanent record. Then brought before a judge or whoever, they'll go, okay, this guy had too many Budweiser's, I get it, you know, he's by his car or whatever. It gets downgraded to a misdemeanor. But when we search it and provide it back to DISA, we've got to show them both. Started as a felony, then it became a misdemeanor, then they pled out to a lesser offense. It was deemed a moving violation because the judge was feeling, you know, good that day. And then you move on and you can hire that person. Or you make fun of them with your coworkers or whatever it is you do. So the other case types that aren't as serious for most of the industry, but as I understand a lot of your businesses through working with DISA for 10 years, some of those are important. Ordinance violations, moving violations, traffic. A lot of you guys have drivers that you're screening or individuals who transport goods or information. So what normally may not be as important you know, it's not a f attempted felony, larceny, and oh, they had a like bazooka and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, those are cool when we get those. We are like, oh my God, look at this record. But then the other stuff with, yeah, they were driving and they had um, several speeding tickets in three states in a row on the same day. 
okay, this person was hauling and there could be, you know, something going on with this, or they were impaired in one state and they were driving through Georgia and they went through Tennessee and they were good, but when they got to Kentucky, another DUI within the same week. All right, that's a huge issue from a risk standpoint and an exposure standpoint to all of you guys. So that's why we always try to make sure that we're reporting not only the initial charge and statute what it was, but if it changes. Because you can plead out to lesser offenses. Things in states are different. We call that state skipping, where someone will like disclose they have a charge that's pretty serious in one place, and then they won't disclose that they had anything in Kentucky because they just pled out to a minor offense and they don't think it's going to get picked up. But when you see the entire case history, you're like, oh my God, that was your third DUI this week. You just got lucky that that state didn't know about the other two. So those are the things that we look at when we compile the data together and we go, oh, gotcha. Here you go. We'll pass that on. So any questions on case types, how they vary, why they're booked, how they can get changed, anything like that? All good? Okay. Um, this is my last section before I'm going to turn it over, is um, hits in dispute. You guys ever dealt with that? Someone disputes a hit? I swear to God that's not me. I swear to God. I mean, there's got to be another guy named Vince Brote who's six foot 250 with black hair who did that thing where I live. But it's not me. I need this job, right? You all kind of dealt with that. So this could probably be its own session. I'll try to be brief. And, um, but hits in dispute. I tried to think of the three or four things that most, um, we call you guys end users, by the way. Here in the furniture section, they're our client. You guys are the end user. You're the ones actually using this data at the end point. So congratulations. Consider yourself an end user. That's great. Um, maybe someday I'll get there. Um, why can disputes take longer than the original check? Why do you think that might be? Audience participation time. Anybody brave? You don't count, you already know this. Come on, no gold star. Why do you think it takes longer? To prove it. Yeah, to prove it, right? We have to take extra steps to make sure that whatever was done originally, it was not only replicated, but there wasn't anything askew or missing. And what we may have to do is, if it's online, we may have to go in person to check. And if it was in person and there's a terminal, we may then check with the clerk to make sure. And if it was clerk assisted to start and it took a fortnight, then we've also got to get those court copies to make sure the clerk didn't screw up. And if there are court copies involved, well, then you've got, to, you've got to go back the other way. Well, what does it say online? And you're matching these things up and saying, all right, let's take extra special care that this individual who has 30 days to get a response back gets it not only in a timely fashion, but it's got to be 100% correct. If you mess up a dispute, lawsuit, right? Ugh, bummer. Just brought the room down on that one. Um, how are the results compared? We do that. DISA does that. There's a lot of comparison. If we did the original search, somebody orders a recheck or a dispute, it's still in our system for at least a couple years. And we look at that and we go, OK, um, what was originally reported at the time? Were there any screenshots of the online system? Were there any court copies to compare to? What do we have now? What's changed? Now, there could be instances where something was pending. Maybe somebody didn't show for a court date. A bench warrant was issued to be continued. That's kind of like, oh my gosh, all right, here we go. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? We don't know. We've got to check like six months later. So we'll do that recheck six months later, and they were found guilty, or they deferred a sentence, whatever it is. So sometimes that's where things can be different. Um, there we compare those results together. But usually if a case has been fully disposed of, meaning there's been a disposition or a judgment or a sentence, and that was set in stone. The only thing that's going to change usually is the post-sentencing actions, if I said that correctly, like the revocation of probation. Did they go to defensive driving school? Did they have that gizmo in their car they had to breathe into every 10 minutes and started beeping? You know, things like that. Did, did, they, did they do the, yeah, whatever that thing is, I don't know the name. Um, but that's what happens with rechecks after the fact. Um, is this where court copies are good? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the court copy can prove something was incorrect the first time, or it can hold up the original result. Again, that takes longer. And who wants to pay more money for a recheck? I mean, if you get it right, you know, you don't want to have to pay a second time. Nobody wants to do that. Um, the big $64 million question is, what happens when the initial result and the disputed recheck are the same? And that's your dude. 
or do debt. I mean, that's, that's it. This person is obviously, it's up to you at that point to make a decision what you do with the data and the guidance that DISA has provided you. But I'm willing to bet, you know, mostly nine times out of 10, when the initial result, whether it's online, whether it's clerk, whether it's court, whether it's a court copy, and any type of recheck or dispute provides the exact same information with some sort of secondary la layer of validity or validation, that's the person, that's the applicant. And like I mentioned earlier, to kind of put a, a cap on it, and put it all together, that's why every so often you want to take a look at what your hit rate is. What kind of candidates and applicants are we bringing into our organization, our world, and what does that look like for us as far as talent management? Are those people more disposed to having cases happen later when they're on the job? Possibly, but it all kind of starts up front right here with making sure it's primary source data by whatever the means that it's derived from and that it goes through its normal process through DISA from an FCRA adjudication standpoint. So, any questions for me before I depart? Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Deborah, and she's gonna talk about, all right, what happens after, after the fact when there's a hit. Cool, thank you. Vince, I appreciate the uh, introduction, um, and um, this is the, the uh, logical segue to what I'm going to be talking about, which is the adverse action process. And I assume it's this little arrow here, yes. So what happens is, of course, um, Vince and his team send back data to us, records um, that we at DISA determine whether to report or not. And so we base our reporting on the uh, um, Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, DISA is considered to be a uh, consumer reporting agency by the uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act. And a CRA, that's a consumer reporting agency, is one that regularly engages in whole or in part in the practice of assembling or evaluating consumer credit um, for the purpose of furnishing consumer reports to third parties, which would be you, um, and which uses any means or facility of interstate commerce, which means um, email, snail mail, um, telephones, that sort of thing. So clearly, DISA fits into that. Um, wait, I think I went too far. Yes. And so a consumer report, which is what we provide to you, um, is, is any kind of report that uh, talks about a consumer, and that would be your employee, um, their mode of living, uh, their credit capacity, character, um, any information that, um, this, that, that refers to a person's eligibility for employment or any other purpose authorized under the, and the, under the FCRA. And of course for you, it's, it's the employment. So in the end, uh, once we report the information to you, and I'm sorry, my, my information is a whole lot drier than, than his, so I apologize for that. Um, anyway, so as the employer, it's up to you to make the determination whether to employ a candidate. If you make that determination based upon anything that we report to you in a consumer report, then that's when the adverse action process begins. One of the things that I'd like to make uh, completely clear um, is that it's the employer, not the CRA or the researcher um, who's responsible for making the notification to the candidate um, or the applicant, the employee, um, that you're going to be taking adverse action um, on, on that person. And by adverse action, of course, I mean you're not going to hire that person, you're not going to give that person a promotion, you're not going to uh, give that person a raise, um, any of those sorts of things. So there's an actual process that's required to be followed in, in order to uh, appropriately and correctly um, um, take an adverse action um, on, a, on an applicant. The first thing is the, the pre-adverse action process. And, and that notice is provided to the applicant during the period when you're trying to decide whether to hire the person or not. Um, and the FCRA, which is what we are all uh, uh, governed by, requires that before an employer declines an applicant or withdraws an offer, the employer has a responsibility to place the applicant on notice. And um, 
that notice would be considered to be the pre-adverse notice. And the candidate then has a time in which to dispute uh, the findings of the report, which is what we were just talking about, uh, what, what Vince was talking about, how, how people dispute um, what we may or may not report. But as the, as the employer, there are two things uh, you should be aware of. Um, please don't ever um, let the candidate know that you will be taking adverse action, i.e. you won't be hiring the person uh, before you send both the pre-adverse and the adverse action. Also, please be aware that we as DISA uh, will never tell your candidate um, what your hiring decision is. That is not something we would ever do, and we have had people call and ask, but we will never, ever give that information out because that's your decision and it's up to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So as far as, as, as part of the um, pre-adverse action um, process, the, the first notice is, um, it includes the letter ad advising the applicant of the potential adverse action, a copy of the report, and a copy of the summary of rights. Now the Fair Credit Reporting Act uh, defines what the, what the summary of report, uh, summary of rights looks like and what it contains. Um, it's available online. Uh, we make copies available uh, to you. You can always get a copy from us. And giving this notice serves three purposes. One, um, it keeps both you and us uh, in compliance with the FCRA, which obviously we need to do. It also makes the applicant aware of any information that's being used to make a hiring decision. And then it gives the applicant an opportunity. Once again, we're gonna talk about uh, disputing any what they consider to believe um, is erroneous information. So uh, once you make the decision um, about hiring the candidate, uh, then you have a responsibility to notify the candidate that adverse action has been taken. And so at that point, then you will need to send a copy um, of the adverse action notice and um, specific information um, related to the consumer reporting agency that provided um, the report. That would be us. You need to tell them that we're the ones who provided the information. Um, and then you also need to let them know that they still have um, 60 days to dispute the information that's in the report. Now, technically speaking, one of the reasons for, for the pre-adverse and then the adverse process is um, you send the pre-adverse and then five to 10 days later, depending on the state and the jurisdiction, um, you would send the, the adverse notice. And during that period, theoretically, the, the, the candidate does have the opportunity to dispute whatever is in the report. Um, but what I will tell you is that um, we at DISA will take um, the dispute pretty much at any time. So for example, what happens sometimes is that a candidate gets a copy of a report, they find out that, they've, um, that their uh, felony uh, record is, is on the report, and they will call us and say, oh, but that got um, uh, pled down to a misdemeanor and, and you guys reported it as a felony. So we do our research, we, we work with Vince's team and, and, and do the research and, and maybe it got pled down and maybe it's really a misdemeanor and maybe it didn't, but we still do the reinvestigation, obviously. And sometimes um, the, the candidate is correct and sometimes they are not, as, as, as Vince pointed out. Um, but we will notify you and let you know um, what the results of our, of our research is. So in any event, with the, with the um, adverse action process, GISA has some solutions for you, and you're more than welcome to take advantage of them to the extent possible. So at DISA, um, we offer solutions based upon whether it's a pre-employment or site access background screening. So I'm not sure, I can't see everybody out there, but um, pre-employment, of course, is, is for anybody, uh, any applicant uh, for any particular position, whereas site access, typically that, that is around the um, uh, DCC and the, and the consortium. Um, both of them, however, are uh, governed by the FCRA, so you need to be aware of that. <coughs> Excuse me. So the process around uh, corporate uh, pre-employment uh, purpose uh, uh, backgrounds, um, DISA will notify you when the report is complete. 
Uh, we will indicate whether the client has any adverse information. The report obviously will tell you that. Um, as the employer, it's up to you to decide whether the candidate does or does not meet your standards. And when you're ready to make a hiring decision, then you, then you follow the, the adverse action process. Makes sense, right? So for the corporate graded, that's a, it's a little bit different. Some of you have uh, corporate graded packages. And so the process there is um, when you have uh, 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 a criteria of standards that you provide to DISA, um, we will look at the report and based upon your standards that you've provided to us, we will determine whether the person uh, meets your standards or does not meet your standards. If they meet your standards, of course, we will grade them as approved and you will get a notification that they've been approved. Any applicant who doesn't meet your standards um, is graded as needs review. And so you'll need to go into the system and into the DISA work system and click on view report and then you complete your review. You decide what you're going to do with that, with that person. Um, and then there's a drop down menu and you change the client review status from needs review to approved or not approved. So for example, if for some reason um, the person has one minor misdemeanor or a speeding or something of that sort and, and, and you're really okay with that even though it doesn't, doesn't exactly meet your criteria or your standards, um, <coughs> you may decide that the person's approved anyway because you're really not that concerned about a speeding ticket or, or, or a, a minor misdemeanor. But if the person has a felony, um, or theft or, or, or something that, that is concerning to you, then you will call them not approved. And so when you select not approved, our system will then um, initiate the adverse action uh, notification process. And so either way, for a pre-employment, um, uh, in a pre-employment situation, um, anytime there is adverse action um, DISA Works generates uh, an email with the adverse action notice and a copy of the summary of rights, a second email with a link to the actual background report, and then an email with an adverse action notice. And if in the end um, you decide um, not to hire the candidate uh, based upon information in the report, um, you'll send the pre-adverse action uh, notice, a copy of the report, and a copy of the summary of rights. And then after a period of five to 10 days, the um, adverse action notice along with a copy of, another copy of the summary of rights. In the meantime, of course, the candidate has the opportunity to dispute the, the findings of the report. <coughs> so I included, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I included this flowchart because I thought it might be um, useful when we do send out the, the, um, the uh, uh, slides uh, because I think you might find it interesting what the, what the process is that, that we go through. And basically, this is the process I just um, initially um, uh, described. And uh, now for, for the consortium, it's a little bit different. Um, we actually at DISA uh, uh, send out the actual copies on your behalf. So if you have a site access um, applicant, we will actually generate the paper documents, um, that both the pre-adverse and the adverse, and we mail them directly to the employee on your behalf. Now, the thing to keep in mind, of course, is that although the letter says that there's adverse information, that doesn't necessarily automatically disqualify a person from site access. So for example, <coughs> Um, you know, at Exxon, they have um, a level four cutoff, or at Chevron, they have a two. So a person may have a misdemeanor, and he can go to, to Exxon, but maybe he can't go to Chevron, or she, I have to say. Um, so, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the person can't get a job, and, and um, it just indicates that the person has something on their record. Now, um, I will say that the, um, uh, we recommend that, that you take a look at the status on the employee dashboard or just checking option um, in order to determine whether they're eligible. And there is a process um, that you can, can do to determine 
um, uh, whether a person can, can access a particular site uh, if you work together with the with the owners, and there is a process in the in the uh, uh, policies in the consortium policies, on on working with the the owners to get um, eligibility for for a particular candidate. If for some reason uh, you wanted to do that, what I will also tell you is that on many occasions we uh, receive calls from applicants who want us to either um, change a grade or um, uh, help them get access when when their grade uh, eliminates them from from a particular site. And as sympathetic as we are, uh, because we all you know obviously either love or want our jobs, um, and we we try to explain to them uh, as best we can that they will need to work with you, the employers, um, who will then be able to work with the the, the owners. Um, to possibly get access for them. But we, as DISA, can't do that. And, and that's a hard conversation sometimes to have, truly it is. Um, we've had people, you know, on the phone crying, you know, I really need this job. And, and it's really hard some days to say, there's nothing I can do. Um, <coughs> although sometimes I have to be completely honest with you here. Sometimes I want to say, well, then you shouldn't have been a thief. But I don't. I would never, ever, ever say that, obviously. But it's in the back of your mind. I'm totally honest here. Um, and, and then, so, of course, we, we defer them to you and, and refer them to you so that um, if you feel like they're an appropriate candidate, then you can work with the, with the owners um, to, have, to, to get the person on, on site. So this is the process that we, the flowchart that we that we use um, for for site access, um, um, and <coughs> it's really loud out there. Is it just me? <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, so this is the this is the process uh, that we that we use, and and again, it's very similar to to the other process, but um, as I said, we actually send out the documents on your behalf. And I can tell you that um, we spend a great deal every single morning, a great deal of time um, printing out those letters and, and, and mailing them off um, on your behalf. So um, that's actually all I have. Um, again, a little bit drier than, than Vince's presentation, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, but if anybody has any questions, I'll try to hear them and, 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 and answer. Or if anybody has any more questions for Vince, feel free. She's over there taking a picture of me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm truly very sorry. Oh, thank you. How long do the records stay in DISA? I'm sorry, how like long Like if they, they had a misdemeanor or felony, how long do they stay in DISA, the records. How long does it stay in our system? Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, um, we don't purge anything. Okay. <laughs> it's on your permanent record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh, the thing is right in my eye. I apologize. Are there limits how far you go back? Seven I'm sorry. years, three years? Yes, seven years. So the, well, let me talk about that, actually, very quickly. So the Fair Credit Reporting Act permits us to report um, crimes, convictions of crimes, forever. We can report them forever. Non-convictions, dismissals, um, adjudicated, uh, uh, re, you know, released, that sort of thing, anything that's not a conviction, we can only report for seven years. Now, what I will also tell you is that in Texas, Louisiana, some other states, you know, you, uh, there are some states where you can only report seven years and that hasn't been preempted by federal law. But I will also say that um, DISA's decision is uh, not to report any convictions. We don't report convictions typically. So it's, uh, you know, that's just a decision we've made as an organization. 
So <clears throat> if a candidate has, um, say, two DWIs and a theft, and the graded background check comes back as a three and does not permit them to go in, because one of the DWIs was, had a child, you know, it was a felony. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so um, after seven years, does any of that fall off or, or is it, will it always be a three? I believe it falls off. Okay. Yeah. After seven years? Yeah, okay. it should. Okay, thank you. That's my understanding. That light is really bright out there, guys. <laughs> In terms of the seven-year um, kind of cutoff that you provide, if you have a person that committed a felony, for example, and on you know January 2007, um, they have a seven-year term, do you account for the release date of the felon, or would basically the day that they get out of jail they would have a clear and free background? That's an excellent question. So depending on whether it's site access or otherwise, if it's pre-employment, it's a little bit different. Um, but uh, for, for, for site access, anything over seven years um, is, is, does not get counted toward the, the score. So that seven years would, would typically start on the day of the conviction but if the person has a parole or, um, or they're in, in prison, then it gets counted from the date they're released from parole. However, just keep in mind that does not mean probation. So if someone is convicted and they're put on probation, the conviction date is still the seven years. Hope that helps. Yeah. <laughs> Got you running there. <laughs> um, one time I had an applicant that I run a background on them, and they were actually convicted of murder. I'm sorry. I had an applicant one time, and they were actually convicted of murder, but their background score was only a five. Why wouldn't it have been a seven? Just curious. So if someone, for example, um, Again, depending on whether it's whether it's um, pre-employment or, or or site access. So, example for example, if a person was convicted of murder in like nine and eighty-five, say, and they, who knows why this would happen? But if they only got fifteen years because maybe it was just a manslaughter, just, um, so then so then we're talking nineteen ninety and maybe they're only on parole for ten years. That brings them up to two thousand. So that's 19 years ago. So, yeah. So it would probably still be on, you know, it, Vince would probably still report it to us, but, and it, and it would be in, in, in the data, but, but it wouldn't be part of the, part of the score. And so um, just a reminder, Vince and I can be um, uh, communicated with at, at either of these uh, emails and phone numbers. And please, anybody, um, feel free to call me. Um, I'm more than willing always to talk about backgrounds. Um, I've been doing this for over 20 years, love it. Um, I'm more than willing to help anybody. So just give me a holler. <laughs>